What happens when the entrepreneurs of greatest talent arrive on the continent of greatest need? In a unique challenge, three of Ireland's brightest business brains have agreed to travel to Africa, where they'll put their renowned vision to the test in countries of extreme crisis. Can their brilliance in business be harnessed to help the poorest of the poor? When removed from the boardroom, will their acclaimed ingenuity stand up to scrutiny? And will hope survive when first world values and third world realities collide? Last September, at the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Awards, John O'Shea, the head of Aid Agency Goal, received a special award. With the country's most successful business people focused on him, John made the most of the moment. But I would like to ask you to take a week or two out of your life and just go and watch people eke out a precarious existence in rubbish heaps where they're fighting with rats for sustenance because the people of the third world, the millions of them, need that entrepreneurial support. The impact of the challenge that John issued would resonate long after the glittering event with award winner Michael Carey agreeing to travel to Malawi. Michael Carey, the head of Jacob Fruitfield, won the industry category at the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Awards. Through a series of high-powered acquisitions, he has brought a 150-year-old company back into Irish ownership, investing his faith in food brands ranging from fig rolls to chef sauce. John O'Shea set up the aid agency Goal almost 30 years ago and they are currently operating in 15 countries worldwide. In Malawi, Goal run a food distribution centre in the district of Nasanje, three hours south of Blantyre. Michael strikes me as a guy with plenty of basic common sense. It's common sense with a little bit of entrepreneurial skill that has made the entrepreneurs the great people in terms of generating income and so forth and profits that we have in Ireland at the moment. Michael is one of this number. He now has a unique opportunity, certainly unique for him in the context of his life and in his business career. John O'Shea is a, uh, a remarkable individual. Uh, he is entirely and utterly mad. Uh, he's completely over the top and uh, he needs to be to do the job he's doing to make the impact he makes. Uh, he's an extraordinary individual. Malawi is a beautiful country in East Africa, but it is also one of the poorest places on the planet. 40% of its people live on less than $1 a day, 70% on less than $2 a day. But the potential of its population is held back by hunger. Malawi has experienced famine in five of the last seven years. Mama. very, very conscious that I'm uh, a fish out of water. It's, a, it's an environment that I'm not familiar with. It's an environment that's a, it's very different to my normal day job and, and the area of business that I'm, I'm familiar and comfortable in. John, how are you? You're just in time, how you're just you? in time. There's a woman over here and she's looking for a big strong man to carry a sack of food. How are you fixed? <laughs> how would she carry this? This is too heavy. No, it's too heavy. <laughs> no. That's too heavy. <laughs> Once a month, 4,000 people queue for rations at this centre before walking long distances back to their villages. Without Gold's intervention, these people would struggle to survive. We managed to get in here, get food into the bellies of these people so that the inevitable didn't happen because we all predicted two years ago that a major famine would occur here. But because of the action that was taken, what you're seeing here is part of that action. We do this in about 20 different areas of the district. So practically everybody in the district will get enough food to see them through the really dangerous time when the harvest hasn't come true for them. But if, for example, we didn't have this food distribution today yeah. and you and I came back here in two weeks' time, I wouldn't be asking you to carry food. I'd be asking you to bury bodies. <laughs> it's hard work. It's incredible how they can carry a bag like that for... 
I've I've never seen anything anything like this before in my life. This is a, uh, an incredibly emotional uh, experience for everybody who's here uh, seeing this. Um, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary to see these children and these families in desperate need of food. As I walk around, I'm feeling like I'm imposing physically. I'm, I've obviously been fed better. I've, I've grown taller. I'm, I'm standing twice their height in some cases. Seeing this firsthand is, uh, is making an impact on me today. I suspect I don't realise how much of an impact it's making on me just now. Edna Wisted is widowed with four children. She arrives early in the morning and waits her turn for a ration of beans, vegetable oil and maize. She will split the heavy bag with a family member and then walk six miles back to her village. The long walk is of little consequence to Edna. In her past, the burden of hunger has weighed much heavier. <laughs> I used to think when I when I saw you on TV, I used to think you were over the top and extreme. My God! But when I when I see this here today, I think you're the most reasonable man I've ever met. I don't uh, know how you're so restrained. I don't know how you you hold yourself back from <laughs> from being more extreme. It's this is extraordinary what's happening here, and I will do whatever I can to help. Michael leaves Nasanje to take up John's challenge, with the problems of Malawi's food security very much in mind. Malawi is faced with the need for aid, but aid alone is not going to solve its problems. This country needs support to develop trade. The food manufacturing sector here is very, very undeveloped. The natural resources in this countryside are just not being exploited. And I would really love to be able to initiate some sort of commercial activities that would help to influence the economic development of Malawi in some way. Michael's plan is to travel around southern Malawi to meet with food producers and growers and to try and identify products that could be exported to Ireland. He hopes to provide a fair price and a route to market for subsistence farmers who are struggling to survive. It would be good if we could meet for, uh, for just about half an hour. I have a lot to learn. Uh, we're here to meet a lot of people. Wouldn't it be a, a fantastic achievement if somehow this country could become a, a, an exporter of food products in the future, at some point in the future become a serious exporter of products rather than uh, needing and uh, having to have uh, handouts of food uh, for their own people? Chili sauce offers strong export possibilities, but a visit to a sauce-making factory near Blantyre is not looking promising. The owner has not even turned up for the appointment and the power is down. A staff member offers Michael a demonstration of the manually operated production line. When we put the bottle here, we open the, the gate valve here mm -hmm. and then to fill in the sauce and we close the gate valve and we, we put now the cup on the bottle. He closes the bottle as quickly as possible. Do they ever burn their hands? Does the heat ever? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. It would be very hot, but of course we, we, they put on the glove. When was this production line run last time? When was it last uh, uh, it, used? It, 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 it was on um, uh, Wednesday last week. Wednesday of last week. Yes. Okay. Yes. This visit has uh, been a, a reflection of the reality of food manufacturing in in Malawi. Um, the despite the the products maybe may be good. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the quality standards within the factory are, are low. Um, uh, I'm not going to name this company. It will be unfair on the, on the business itself. It will be difficult to, to work with a company like this uh, to source product for sale in, in Europe. So a company like this needs real, needs real help. And, and maybe these are the sort of companies that we should be working with to, to help. But unfortunately, we won't be selling this product in Ireland. Tea is the second most important export crop for Malawi. 
Vast estates employ thousands, but the average pay for a picker is less than a dollar a day. Michael's company markets and distributes the Bewley's brand in Ireland, so he travels 30 kilometres out of Blantyre to a tea growing region. Michael wants to see if there are any initiatives he can implement among smallholders. On this trip, it's vitally important for us that we identify opportunities to develop commerce, not with these large tea plantations, that's not what they need, they don't need a, a route to market. Uh, it, we need to do something with the smaller farmers and help them to solve some of their problems. The Satemwa tea plantation works closely with smallholders who own plots of land on the fringes of the estate. Alfred is one of these smallholders. He has a long lease on two hectares of land and he employs eight pickers. He sells his crop directly to the Satemwa estate who process his leaves in their factory. When Alfred was speaking about improving his income, uh, he spoke about the need to have a, a larger land holding. But even with his existing land, he may be able to improve his income. One possibility is to improve the type of, uh, of uh, tea that he grows, improve the value of the type of tea that he grows. And this is a, a speciality tea, a, a tea that generates much more in, in price in the marketplace from, from the tea estate. White tea is the, uh, made from the bud of the tea plant. It's the most expensive part. It's a very limited volume uh, and, and it's the premium output. Growing products like this, white tea, is something which this estate is helping to develop. We may be able to help to introduce this product in time, when it's ready, into the Irish market or perhaps into the European market. As Michael continues with this challenge, global factors beyond his control mean that the search is bittersweet. Some of the more obvious solutions are prohibited due to trade embargoes. We're driving through the countryside in, um, in Malawi and we're surrounded by sugarcane. Uh, we're surrounded by acres and acres of uh, growth of sugarcane. It's probably 10 foot high. In our business at Jacob Fruitfield, we use 5,000 tonnes of sugar. Perhaps in the future we could use sugar from a country like this if the trade barriers were not in place. On the way over on the plane, I came across this magazine, Air Malawi, and reading it, uh, there was a, an ad for a company called Tampala. Uh, a manufacturer of a range of products. This is a company that we're going to visit on spec. We're just going to arrive, uh, we're going to go in and we see if, if this company is potentially one that we can work with. The Tambala Food Company in Blantyre employs over 30 people and is locally owned. Among the range of products packaged here are rice, salt, fruit juices and peanuts. May I open this? You can open, no problem. This may be a, uh, a practical issue that would have to be resolved. A, uh, it would be very important that we had a pack that the consumer could open. It's okay, it's open. It's open. Um, so a, a tear strip on the, a, a nick on the side of the pack would uh, allow us to... Yeah, okay. So that's the red skins. Yeah. Tambala peanut butter. Okay. Which now we manufacture from the same nuts. And always in plastic? Yeah. The normal packaging format for a product like this mm -hmm. in Europe is in glass. In glass. Um, but it may be possible. We could pr present it as a positive that sure, it's packed in plastic sure. and it's, it's, it, it may be better for the in consumer fact, as a squeezy it. bottle. That was a very interesting uh, visit. We went in there on spec and we got to meet the main man. 
Uh, it's an interesting company. It has very similar history to our own. Uh, it came from a much larger organisation and a group of shareholders have now acquired it, local shareholders, and they're doing their best to turn it around financially. Uh, I think there may be some opportunities there. They do have some obvious uh, quality issues that need to be addressed, but we possibly, possibly we could work with them to improve their standards and help them to develop their business in a way that allows them to export regionally in this area or even to Europe, potentially. It was refreshing to see that uh, some aspects of standards were very good in there. For instance, there was uh, uh, plastic gloves on the hands of the people who were, who were sorting out some of the nuts. The most likely uh, outcome, the most likely potential piece of business there would be for us to source uh, peanuts packed in consumer packaging and brought into the Irish market uh, and, and sold by us, by Jacob Frisfield, in the Irish market on their behalf. Peanuts are a cash crop that could be developed more in Malawi. Most small farmers concentrate on maize and their families depend on it for survival. The problem is that not all land is suitable for maize growing. Soil erosion is common and the crop often fails. Few realise that an alternative cash crop would provide greater food security. For example, in a remote village south of Blantyre, a group of women have formed a collective to grow chilies. While Margaret and her family have planted peanuts in the ground to complement their maize. Do you bring these uh, peanuts to a market and sell them? Uh, yes. Yes. On the edge. Ah, it's like opening a bottle of champagne. Mm. And it's good. Mm. It's good. Being here this morning, meeting Margaret, who's growing these peanuts in this land, uh, is, is what it's all about. It's what this trip is all about. Uh, we want to initiate something that will help these people who are working on the land, uh, and I, I think we will find a way. A small, unassuming brown nut, the macadamia, may hold the key to the future survival of the smallholder. It grows in trees and falls to the ground when ripe. Macadamia nuts are exported to Asia and Europe. This is a pack of macadamia nuts that I purchased in the Swan Centre in Rathmines uh, the day before we left uh, for Malawi. Uh, for this pack, I paid four euro for 100 grams. These products are hugely high value. These are, are far in excess of most things that are grown on this land. Given that this retails at four euro, um, so comparing it to say, for example, a bottle of uh, mineral water, the cost of shipping it, the space taken up in the, uh, in the container, the space, needed to, uh, to transport these products it is totally uh, there's, no, there's no comparison there's no comparison this, a container load of this stuff would be worth literally hundreds of thousands of euro As part of his fact finding mission Michael visits the Makandi estate one of the biggest growers of macadamia in Malawi the orchards are well established and the nuts are processed in a factory on the estate Michael is here to meet with manager Lawrence Lawrence, who is keen to see smallholders develop cash crops and improve their own food security. What we would be looking at is trying to encourage the, the villagers with their small plots to grow this sort of tree there instead of growing a maize crop, which in this rainfall doesn't produce anything. At the moment, maize accounts for a huge proportion of, of well, agricultural it, it, outputs. Any, any bit of village land will 99% have maize grown on it, whether it's a maize growing area or not. Why is that? It seems crazy. It's a cultural thing. They basically believe that if they don't have maize, they don't live. It, it's, it's more about their diet and culture that they can get it. And, and not having any sort of encouragement, extension or, or, or marketplace to develop cash crops is a problem. If we can convert the villagers to grow in the correct areas, grow tea, coffee and macadamia, they will create a cash crop and be able to use that to buy maize and let, let the people in the dry areas grow maize. The macadamia tree can thrive on the fringes of holdings and thus allows the farmers to continue to grow maize, their bread and butter crop. It needs little maintenance and within five years each tree will yield a full crop, providing a desperately needed cash source at harvest. I think the, the, the way to in, encourage a smallholder is not to take what he has away from him by by blending his small production into a massive operation like this. The smallholder, to my mind, has got to be, remain an individual mm -hmm. and remain it. So his, his product must be marketed separately, and I think that's where a concern like yours certainly has, has huge benefits to come in. Lawrence is a very interesting individual. He's very knowledgeable about the issues that are facing the food industry here in Malawi. 
Um, he, he seems to have the, the best of this industry at heart and he's really making efforts to, to improve the life of the smallholders. And now that I've heard some of the detail about how these products are grown, how they supplement the other outputs of these farms, uh, it, it looks like this may well be an opportunity. Crocodile <laughs> in the river, just on the left. A boat trip on the Shire River will take you into Luwandi National Park. For Michael, it's time to catch the sights and to reflect on an enlightening week. This last week has been an extraordinary week for me. We've, uh, we've seen some amazing things, huge contradictions, uh, absolute poverty on one hand, great, fantastic potential on the other hand. Some of the economic aspects of this country are very similar to Ireland. Back about 150 years ago, we had famine. We found our way out of it as a country. We have had some incredible success in Ireland to become one of the wealthiest nations on earth. This country today is one of the poorest nations on earth. Some of the stuff that we're doing will have a, a, a small impact and we will hopefully be able to play some role in moving this country up from the bottom of the league table of the poorest countries in the world. And, and many more initiatives will be needed to really achieve something for Malawi. As a result of his trip to Malawi, Michael now plans to offer advice to local food companies on raising standards and improving skills. He also plans to investigate markets for speciality teas. But he believes that the macadamia nut provides the best opportunity for him to help the most vulnerable of Malawi's people, the smallholders. The macadamia nut opportunity uh, has a whole load of, of aspects to it that could potentially become commercialised in Ireland in the coming months. Uh, we may be able to use macadamia nuts brought in in bulk. We can use it as ingredients in cookie manufacturing. We could pack it and sell it in the, in the stores as a snack product. These are wonderful products. They're very, very nutritious. They're very healthy snack products. And there's a real demand for those products in Ireland. Three months later, and Michael is speaking at a product launch in Dublin. We went to Africa and we saw smallholder farmers in Malawi struggling to feed their families, queuing for handout of a bag of grain when they should have been growing crops for the, for the markets, running out of maize when they should have been using their land to grow cash crops. Michael has come together with some of the most successful companies in the Irish food industry to launch a new brand called The Heart of Africa. This brand provides a route to the Irish market for ethical suppliers. And Michael has ensured that macadamia nuts from Malawi are a prominent part of the product range. All profits that are generated by the sale of the Heart of Africa brand will be redistributed back to ethical businesses, uh, business opportunities in sub-Saharan Africa. Twelve weeks after being in Malawi, we now see these products on sale here in, in Dublin in a shop in Ranala. Uh, it's, it's fantastic that it's happened so quickly. Personally, uh, I am committed to ensuring that this succeeds. The people we're working with in Malawi are committed to making an impact. They want to see an improvement in the lives of these smallholder farmers. And they are going to work with us. We are going to send people to Malawi. They will work with us to ensure that more and more smallholder farmers are extending their crops encouraging more people to grow a cash crop and providing an income for their families. Michael has married his initiative in fair trade with a commitment to aid. He has assembled a committee to organise a business conference, attracting speakers with global profiles and with all costs waived. All money raised will go towards a school feeding programme in Malawi. The day we were at the food distribution centre, we were speaking with the workers from Goal. Uh, who are doing fantastic work there and, and talking about the needs they have in other areas of Malawi. And the, the area of, uh, of providing food to children in school seems to have this double benefit. It both encourages the children to go to school and encourages mothers to send them to school and also feeds them so they can learn while they're there. Entrepreneurial activity in Africa can make a real impact. The small businesses can employ people, they can create an income for families, uh, businesses can make a, a real uh, impact. Entrepreneurship is about making the most of scarce resources. Where else in the world could an entrepreneur make more of an impact than in an area like Africa where resources are scarce? Next week, oil entrepreneur Aidan Heavey travels to Uganda. Gold is in Uganda because it's one of the poorest countries in the world. Tolo is in Uganda because of the oil exploration. 
How can a man who has already worked in every country in Africa answer the challenge laid down by John O'Shea?